thank you. Brilliant. Hello, everyone. It's so lovely to be here and what an introduction to live up to. So as Pete said, it's such a really fantastic topical area for everyone because even though they like pete said the service industry is it has a massive impact around burnout a lot of compassion fatigue but what they've actually found is that because of the life we live now and like pete said the last year and a half we've gone through this burnout is filtering across occupations so regardless whether you're in service care or not burnout is huge and they are calling it a burnout epidemic, but I refuse to use any word with demic on the end of it <laughs> for at least another year. I just can't do it. So I'm going to call it a big problem. And basically today we're going to really quickly dabble in it because we've only got 10 minutes. So we're going to really quickly look at kind of what burnout is, really understand it. Because it was once I was able to understand what burnout looked like, I was able to spot in some really close people to me as well. So it's really key. Then from there, we will have a look at some tools because burnout isn't suddenly something you wake up in the morning and you experience. It is a step process. So I want to look at um, how stress might show itself when it's evolving. And then a little tool you can take away from um, my mental health first aid course to really bring your awareness to any stress that you might be experiencing, how you can manage that. So I will go through at a good pace. And, and like um, Pete always um, says, so we, I'll be here at the end if you've got any questions. So firstly, before I start, I've got a couple of slides for you. I just want to check in the room and gauge what kind of background we're coming from. So firstly, who here is a solo entrepreneur you know, flying the flagship on their own, no employees? Hands up. Okay, a good amount. And who here has um, their own company, but they have employees of some sort, or they plan to have employees very soon in the future? Okay, lovely. And who here works for someone and employed as a company? Okay, we have a good selection. Fab. Thank you for that. So that's going to really help me direct it as we go through um, to, to your level. So let's have a look. I'm going to share some slides with you now and we'll get started. So firstly, as we go through burnout, like I said, that if we can really understand what burnout is, we can spot it in ourselves, hopefully, and those around us. Now, the problem is we often have a bit of a blind spot to ourselves, and our own mental health. So it's really good that if we can constantly work on building our awareness, we can just like Pete said on his post in LinkedIn, once you can spot it, you can get in ahead of time and hopefully prevent burnout from um, evolving. So firstly, the really, really fancy term for burnout is occupationally specific, specific dysphoria, which I can't even say. So don't even worry about it. But it's basically you're so dissatisfied with your work life, ridiculously dissatisfied. And it's broken down into three areas because often when we think about burnout, the first thing our brains go to is exhaustion. We're just you know absolutely battered which is absolutely an element of it. So there's this overwhelming exhaustion where it's known as flatlining, where you are just absolutely depleted. But there's two other elements which are really important to be aware of. So firstly, people will start experiencing these feelings of cynicism. So they will completely detach from their work. And you'll see that in people around you. And it's, and it's talked about being at the other side of some thick glass because there's nothing that company or that work can do for them now to bring them back feeling good about what they do. And that detachment is a huge, huge problem when that comes in place because it's really, really hard to unpick and undo. And the third part of burnout is around feeling just completely ineffective and lack of accomplishment. So imagine like no matter what you do, you think I just I don't feel like I'm achieving. You feel like the work you're doing means nothing. And again, if you've ever felt in that state where you just think I'm just not adding anything, it means nothing to me. That is soul destroying. And so when you, you can experience burnout with all three of these symptoms here or like two, two, one or two. So it's not all of them have to be at play. But when they are at play, we are in a bad place of how do we unpick that? So that's why the next few slides I'm really going to look at how can we spot it as it's developing. But interestingly, which is one of the interesting areas for me as well around this, is, is actually contributing factors towards it. It's multiple factors. 
So often people think of the workload, which is a huge one, where someone's working so hard, they're doing so much that it just completely depletes them. But that's only part of the puzzle, because then you have all these other elements. So if someone, for example, at work doesn't feel that they have control over their decisions, if they don't feel that they have control over what happens within the company around them, what happens within their workplace, that lack of control and autonomy will eat away at you. And so from a, if you're coming from a management point of view, if you're looking to grow your business and take on people where you already have people, making sure that they feel that they have a level of control and autonomy is so, so important to make sure that you're balancing the their professional stress they might experience, even if you just involve them in some decision making processes along the way. Now, also the reward side that really looks at someone's expectation versus the reward. So it's not saying that because, you know, they have a low wage, it's going to make a burnout appear. It's saying what are they expecting versus what are they um, actually receiving? And does that level out? So again, being aware of that, being aware if you've got employees around you, being very aware of what are their expectations and do their expectations need to be managed or are they, you know, are they actually in line? Now, the community part is a huge thing, which is why mastermind and alliance are so, so important for people who work alone. Because when you work alone, you don't necessarily have that community. You, you, it's a lonely, lonely world. And it's the same for, you know, management positions, because if you if you're you have employees, you're still at a different level to them. And so that you have that kind of detachment that you have to almost have in place from a management level. So it's again, how can you build this community around you to offset any potential effects around burnout? And obviously fairness, you know, do you feel like you've been treating fair, treated fair? Do you feel like you're, the rewards are fair? Everything you within the workplace around you needs to feel that your expectations are being met fairly. And then values in terms of are your values actually aligned with the organization's values, which from the point of view of you know, setting up your employees, if you're taking on employees sooner we have them, what are their values? Because that's absolutely part of what your hiring process needs to be, like you probably know already. That needs to be so, so clear because when they're not aligned, that causes so many problems. And I've just had that in my previous work where I was employed where my values were so different and it eats away your soul. So these are some really important factors to be aware of. Now, interestingly, which you may have found, I, 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 from working on my own, I'm taking on employees in the next few years, um, from working on my own so much, I, I work like a mad worker bee. And I remember people used to always say to me, God, if you keep working like this, you're going to burn out, you're going to burn out, you're going to burn out. And I was always there waiting for this burnout to hit me. And it didn't, like, I'd feel exhausted. I'd feel, you know, some like down sometimes, but it wasn't hitting me like it would when I was working for other people. And what I actually found was my workload was really, really high, but the other factors were ticked off quite well. So I felt like I had control. I felt like I was getting, being rewarded fairly. I felt like I had a community around me of people supporting me. My values were in line with what I was doing. So it helped to offset the problems of workload. And they found that across the board, that it, if you, even if your workload is high, if you're ticking off the other factors, it can help offset that balance. Now, that is not a big plug to say, go and work as hard, but go and have some you know, <laughs> you know, great community around you. Obviously, balance is key, but it's just being aware that if you do notice that, you know, if you've got everything else ticked off, you can handle the amount of work you might have to do as a solo entrepreneur. Now, within this as well, keep in mind with from from a point of view of hiring people, from making sure you've got a supportive culture around you. Mental hygiene needs to be the first step in what you create within your culture. So making sure that these factors are fed throughout your company is, is going to be the key to help prevent this burnout, which is getting more and more prevalent now. So like I mentioned earlier, that obviously it's a step process. It is something that doesn't just arrive overnight. And it's actually a very kind of slow erosion of your coping skills and where professional stress increases, but job satisfaction decreases. So you're always looking at how you can level those out a lot better and how you can maintain your coping mechanisms. So I'm going to really quickly show you a, um, a slide around how stress might show itself. And then from there, we'll look at some, a little tool you can use to help manage your coping mechanisms. So firstly, we've and we mentioned this in our first um, breakout room in session one, 
where actually the impact of stress is not just on a mental level it's very very much on a physical level as well and but before i show you this um image here what i do want to pull out is that i am focusing at the moment on the more kind of negative aspects of stress but stress, I really want to kind of bring this home that stress itself is not the enemy. Stress, in, when it's managed effectively and the right levels, it can be really, really positive. It can improve your IQ. It can make you work better. It can, it can bring a whole world of possibilities to you. So stress isn't the enemy. It's just when it's not managed effectively and becomes unhealthy levels. So this is where we're at the unhealthy level here. You'll see, as you look through that, stress has multiple different dimensions of fact. And from, um, I hear from, um, that from your group that actually there was a talk in the last networking event, was it from Jim, who said that he went to the doctor and he experienced physical reactions of anxiety and he was very unwell, didn't realize it was actually anxiety causing that. And that's one thing I really wanna pull out here because we often understand that if stress affects us on an emotional level, cognitive level, behavioral level, we kind of have that understanding quite well. But it a, has a massive, massive physical level. And like Sarah always says, you know, the, actually the connection between your mental and physical health is huge. And so, you know, we're making sure that we're looking for if you're if you've got headaches constant, if you've got um, you know rashes, if you've got all this stuff coming up, that very, very much might be your mental health, not your physical health. So we're keeping it. I always ask myself, why am I experiencing this? You know, what is it linked to? Always have that open because I gave um, I interviewed this police officer for my podcast like many moons ago, and he had a breakdown after 25 years in service. And he's experienced so much trauma like over and over again. And he said, looking back, he realizes the first sign that he was going through this breakdown was actually this pain in his shoulder. And he had no idea what it was linked to. And he said he'd get his pain in his shoulder and he'd go off to the osteopath, get it sorted. And then within a couple of days, it was back again. And he kept going through and through and through this process until actually started having waking up in the middle of the night with panic attacks. You know, and, and looking back, he saw that was the first sign. And actually, if you can spot these signs earlier, then we can step in and try and prevent this burnout from uh, unraveling. So these are some signs to look out for. Now, I'll build on that now with a tool. And that's the last thing I'll take you through before we do um, your breakout question. So this container here is what I want to give to you as a tool, which is from MHFA England. You might have seen this um, before. It's from the Mental Health First Aid course. And it is a fantastic visual tool to see how you can bring awareness to your stress and then manage it. Now, the idea of this is we all have our own container. So I think, you know, I always see my container here. I'll hold my stress here. So like, I've got your container and everyone's containers are different size. So depending on if you've had past trauma and maybe you're so much more resilient from it, or maybe you're increasingly vulnerable from it, you know, all these different reasons will mean that your container is a different size. One, that's really important because people in your team will be able to either handle more stress than you or less stress than you. People in your family, those around you will have different levels of capacity. So it's being aware that everyone's container is different and then working with that. But we've all got this container um, and daily, every day, stress flows in, flow, 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 and whatever it is, small, large, whatever. And if often what we find is that this stress flows in and we don't realize how much our container is starting to fill. And so our container starts to fill and fill and fill until you get what's known as emotional snapping, where it's so, so full that you, know, you lose your keys or something. And that's just enough to boom, you've, you've snapped over the edge. And so and emotional snapping looks different for everyone. So it might be that they, you know, they just absolutely kind of blow their top and start shouting, crying, whatever it is, people will respond to this emotional snapping differently. But what we have along the way, which is something I really want to bring your awareness to, is we all have stress signatures. So as this container is starting to fill and it's starting to bubble up and bubble up, we'll have a sign, we'll have a stress signature that is telling us our container is starting to fill. So maybe, you know, some people will start swearing more. Some people might bang their fists on the table. Some people might eat more. Like when I'm when my stress signature is I will eat everything in my path, ideally the stuff that's crunchy. And so you all we all show different signs. 
And so it's being aware of your signature because you're probably more aware of the signatures of those around you and closest to you than you are of your own sometimes. And so it's like bringing your awareness to that because that's always what we want to do around mental health. And then that, if we can spot it before it gets to that emotional snapping stage. Now, luckily on this container, we have a little helpful friend. And this is your little valve, which I think looks like a sheep's head, which I think you'll all agree, doesn't it? It's not just my Welshness. Uh, this sheep's head here is your release valve. Now, when this release valve is turned on, stress lovely fil filters out and you're able to hold more. Now, can you think about this release valve and the fact that your stresses, so the things that cause you the stress, so less, you know, God forbid, you're running out of toilet roll again, you know, that, you, that's in your container, that still might very much be sitting there, but the pressure you feel around that is released. So I always think of it like the chia seed. You, have you ever, for fun, put a chia seed in some water? And it, this, <laughs> woo, Friday night, um, this chia seed starts to like, you know, bubble up and get big, right? It really starts to expand. I always think about the chia seed, the little bit in the middle, this is a real big <laughs> random um, diversion, but the chia seed is the stressor, the thing causing you the stress, and the stuff around the chia seed is the pressure. So when you release the valve, the chia seed might be sitting there, but all the globule stuff will flow out, which is wonderful. That's what we want. And so it doesn't matter whether the, the stressor is permanent or temporary then, because you're managing the pressure. And so that release valve will come on and, and release stuff for you. Now, what helps it to turn on is your helpful coping strategies. But often we're not always aware of these and we don't engage in them when we're stressed. So some helpful coping strategies might be, you know, meditating, doing yoga with cares, you know, doing, you know, journaling, like all these different things, going for a walk outside, you know, whatever it is for you. And we will all know our own coping strategies. But if we don't, we need to really kind of build on that. And that will help you release your stress. But on the other side, your, your tap can get blocked up. And these are what are known as unhelpful coping strategies. So these are the ones that are the easiest to do that you're most likely to go to when you're feeling stressed and knackered. Like I, I will go and lie face down on the couch, turn on Netflix, eat everything in my path. And even though in that minute, and I know everyone's there with me, in that minute, you'll feel a little bit of release, but longer term, it will block up your tap and it won't allow you to release that chia seed pressure. So it's being aware of all elements of this container. And because we won't have long enough to, in your breakout rooms to kind of unpick your whole thing. But what I would recommend you to do is if you haven't done this before, draw a triangle on your page. And as you just get a blank page, draw a triangle in that container, write the stresses that are present in your life at the moment. Take some time to reflect on it. And then but, uh, what are you, write down what's your stress signature and we'll um we'll look at that in a breakout room in a moment what how do you know what's your emotional snapping look like really pick that apart and then what are your coping strategies both the helpful ones and the unhelpful ones because if you're able to bring awareness to that then you know for example i know mine's eating and things like that so if i'm opening the cupboard door for the fifth time in an hour and just shutting it open it shutting it opening it and things like that i'm like wait wait a minute there's something going on here so again bringing awareness so that we can stop these, this stress from unraveling so that it doesn't get to the burnout level. And so I've got a question for you around that to kind of pick apart your stress container. So Pete, Sarah, would you like me to give the question now or wait? Um, give it now. Give it now, that I will. Okay, so your question, and it's a double one, but if you've got time to do the both bits, is what is your stress signature? So how do you know when your container's starting to fill? What are your signs to look out for? And what do you do when it shows up? So when it's you start feeling stressed, maybe you start swearing more, do, do you kind of get lost into it? Do you do something to counteract it? What do you do most of the time? Because that will show you if you're leaning into like useful coping strategies or more unuseful ones. So have a think of that question um, when you go into your breakout room. And that is it from me. Uh, awesome. Uh, Rebecca, that, that was wicked. Thank you very much.